In this video, we're going to talk about static versus kinetic friction. So to get started, draw a friction versus applied force graph somewhere on your paper. And we are going to talk about what happens to the force of friction as you apply more force. To do that, we're going to take a look at this little animation. So here we have a little tiny mannequin. And this mannequin is going to apply force to this refrigerator. Now, notice that we can also see the force of friction that is resisting and balancing the applied force, thus keeping the refrigerator um, stuck, or we would call that static. So, the force of friction that exists when an object is not moving is something that we call static friction. So, static friction is when the two objects um, are not moving relative to each other or are stuck. Now, two objects can be moving but stuck together, like if you put uh, a box in the back of a pickup truck, it can move with the pickup truck, but it would be stuck to the bed of the pickup truck, and you would consider that static friction. Now, the thing about static friction is that it changes from zero to some value. And while it's changing, the force of friction, of static friction, is just equal to the applied force. So this is, this, this is always going to happen, or this continues to happen, until you reach a push that's so big the object begins to move. And then the applied force is, well, it like takes over. Okay, so let's look at that real quick. When you apply force, friction grows and grows and grows. It's equal, it, it balances, it cancels out the applied force until you get it to start moving, and then look at the friction force it actually decreases a little bit. So let's, talk, so let's talk about that on our graph. Static friction is going to vary from zero to some maximum value, which I'm gonna call F, S max, for static friction. And you could say it like this, F, S, or static friction, is equal to anything between zero and some static maximum friction force. Now, when you are applying force during this static time, the applied force and the friction are equal to each other. So you would see a line on your graph that goes up like this. Oh, let's try that again. Like this. So the friction force and the applied force, they just go up incrementally. They're equal to each other until you reach this thing that we're going to call F's max the maximum static force of friction. Then the object starts to move and the force of friction drops suddenly, um, which is sort of like activation energy if you're familiar with chemical reactions. Okay, so now let's take a look at the force of friction while the object is kinetic or moving. Okay, back to the animation. You apply force, you apply force, the friction force increases and cancels the applied force until it starts to move and decreases just slightly. Okay, so now the friction force is a constant value. It doesn't change. When the object is sliding or moving, then the force of friction is going to be some constant value. It doesn't matter how much force you apply or how little force you apply, the force of friction stays the same. And of course, when you stop pushing, the force of friction will eventually continue to act and then bring that object to a stop. Okay, so let's write this down. Kinetic friction occurs when the object is moving, where the two surfaces are sliding past one another. Um, that's because the word kinetic basically just means moving. Okay, so when the objects are moving, so are sliding across each other. In this case, we call this Fk. It doesn't vary from zero to some maximum value. It's just constant. It is a constant number. Okay, great. So let's see if we can take a look. Oh, and you know what? We should draw this on our graph. A constant force of friction. No matter how much more applied force, how hard you push, it remains constant. So sometimes on this graph, we like to write this. Static. That's the static section of the graph. And then you reach this right here where it's kinetic and the object is moving. Okay, so let's see if we can solve some example problems with this uh, idea of static versus kinetic friction. 
A heavy box is at rest on the floor and you start to push it, so just like the animation. The graph below shows the force of friction between the box and the floor as you apply more and more force. Okay, so here, just like what we were talking about, we've got friction versus applied force. Okay, the first question A asks, what is the force of friction when you push with 20 newtons of force? Okay, so that's asking me to think about this right here when I'm applying force. So you'll notice that when you are applying 20 newtons of force on this graph, you are still in the static section. Remember this increase, this varying changing force would represent the static uh, friction. So you just have to look and kind of think about, oh, you know what? Static means that the friction force has to be equal to the applied force, and so I should see that this goes to 20. Okay, so Fs for static friction equals 20. Okay, good. Now let's look at the next part, B. How much do you have to push for the object to start moving? Okay, so this, this is asking us to find F's max, or the maximum force of static friction. And that's going to occur right here. So I look back on my graph, and it looks like 40 newtons is how much I have to um, push, or that's the maximum amount of static friction. So that's how hard I have to push in order to get it to just start to move. Okay, now let's think about part C. What is the net force when you apply 55 newtons of force? Okay, so these check marks, they all go up by 5, so 55 would be like right here. And, okay, this one's the net force. So what this means is, if we can kind of think about it, we've got our applied force, which we'll call capital F, um, pushing forward, and that's 55 newtons. Those are fives. Then there is a force of friction acting back, which we don't quite know yet. Um, and I'm asked to find the net. So remember the net, or sigma F, is going to be that 55, or that applied force F, minus the force of friction. So I've got 55 newtons. I just need to figure out what is the force of friction so that I can take it away from 55 and get my net. Okay, well, so this is a conceptual question. When you apply 55 newtons of force, then you are here on the graph, and that represents the kinetic portion. So what I do is I take a look at, okay, what's the force of friction here? Okay, so I look right here, and it's about 35 newtons of force. So it doesn't matter if I'm pushing with 50 or 45 uh, or, or, you know, even less. That's, that's how much friction there's going to be, 35 newtons. Okay, so to find the net, I take 35 away from 55, and I'm left with 20. So the net force is 20 newtons. All right, now let's work on um, some word problems. And we're going to take a look at this 22 kilogram box at rest. Uh, and we're going to change this situation up a couple of times. So feel free to write, you push a 22 kilogram box and then sort of change the problem in your notes. You don't have to rewrite this every time if you don't want. You push a 220 kilogram box at rest with a force of 2,000 newtons, but it does not move. What is the force of friction between, oh shoot, that's a say box, between the box and the ground? Okay, well, if I think about this, it's at rest, it doesn't move, so if you apply a force of 2,000 newtons, then in order for the net to be zero, friction also has to be 2,000 newtons. And it's not moving, so we would call this a static friction. So the static force of friction between the rock and the ground is 2,000 newtons. Easy, easy question. Let's change this problem up slightly. Okay, you push the same 220 kilogram box at rest with a force of 2,020 newtons. So now we've increased the force from 2,000 to 2,020. And it finally begins to move. What is the maximum force of static friction between the box and the ground? Well, it's this, 2,020 newtons. It's telling you when it says this right here, it finally begins to move. It's telling you that that is the maximum amount of static friction that can exist to balance your force. 
So if we drew a free body diagram, the force of 2020 newtons would balance F's max of 2020 newtons. We can do congruent marks if we want. But if I apply any more force than that, um, or if it starts to move and I continue to apply this force, um, then we're going to go from our S max and drop down a little bit, right? So our graph looks like that. We're going to drop down a little bit and get into this kinetic region after it finally begins to move. So let's talk about that. You push the same 220 kilogram box while it is moving. So now it's starting to move and you don't push with the same amount of force anymore. Now you push with 2000 newtons and it moves with a constant velocity. What is the force of friction between the box and the ground? Okay, so now the box is moving. It has some velocity to the right. But here's what's important. That velocity is constant. So even though this box is moving to the right, and you're pushing with a force of 2,000 newtons, now you're in the kinetic friction area. And in order for you to have a constant velocity, that now means that your force of friction, which is kinetic because these two surfaces are now sliding past each other, your force of friction is still going to balance the applied force. So you would say that the kinetic force of friction is 2,000 newtons, even though it's moving this time, because now it's moving and you, you pushed with 2,020 newtons of force. So you got over that maximum static friction, and you can push with a little less in order to keep it moving with a constant velocity. Which, if I go to the animation to kind of demonstrate that, it's like saying, okay, you push, you push, you push, static friction, it gets big, it gets big, and now the friction force decreases because it's we're in the kinetic area and now I don't have to apply more force to keep it moving I can actually apply less and if I do that then I'm going to have a constant velocity the object doesn't speed up or slow down it just continues to move to the right we do this all the time when we push things down the hall we have to push really hard to get them to start moving and then once they're moving we don't actually have to push as hard to maintain that speed we just have to balance out the kinetic force of friction which is a little bit less um, which also, this is why you try to rock your car back and forth if it's stuck in the mud or something like that. Okay. Back to the box. You push the same 220 kilogram box while it is moving, okay, so it's moving now, with a force of 900 newtons. What is the net force acting on the box? Okay, so let's remember from before. It's the same box. So we know that the F's max, right, the maximum static friction is 2,020 newtons, um, but the force of kinetic friction is 2,000 newtons. That's what we got from the last problem. Okay, well, the box is moving with a velocity, but now you're only pushing with a force of 900 newtons. Okay, well, it's moving, so you're in the kinetic territory, and the kinetic force of friction doesn't change because kinetic friction is constant. So you would still use that 2,000 newtons for the force of kinetic friction. And the net would be that applied force minus the kinetic force of friction, or 900 newtons minus 2,000 which would give you negative 1,100 newtons, which that's just telling you that the net is to the left, that's what the negative says, and you have 11,000 um, as the magnitude of that force of friction. So this means that the object, as it moves to the right, is going to slow down, which we can show with our little animation. I'll turn on the speedometer to help you kind of see it. If I get the object to start moving, notice the speedometer is increasing because we're accelerating with all this applied force. But now if I bring the applied force so that it's less than the friction force, you can notice, this, notice that the speedometer is going down because I'm still pushing but not enough to overcome the force of friction and eventually we slow to a stop. Okay, so now let's try to do one example that sort of bakes all of this stuff in. 
You pull your 75 kilogram friend on a five kilogram sled with a force of 4, 400 sorry, newtons, and they move with a constant velocity of two meters per second. Okay, so I'm gonna combine the mass of those two to 80 kilograms. And you know when you push with a force of 400 newtons, you move with a constant velocity. So that tells me that the kinetic friction is 400 newtons because they're moving and there's a constant velocity. Okay, then you reduce your pull to 100 newtons. Well, when you do that, the force of kinetic friction doesn't change. So I can take these two forces to find the net. The net is going to be that 100 newtons minus 400 newtons, which gives me negative 300 newtons of net force. Now it asks, how long does it take for your friend to come to a stop? And to, to do that, I, I basically am going to need to use a motion equation. So remember that there are some different motion equations we can use, um, but probably the best one for us to use is this, V equals AT plus V naught, where I know that my final velocity is zero because I come to a stop, and my initial velocity is two. I can write that V naught equals two, going to the right. So what I need to do to find time is get the acceleration from the net force. Do you remember how to do that? Net force is always equal to mass times acceleration. So I can find the acceleration by taking the net force and dividing by the mass. So negative 300 newtons over 80 kilograms is going to give me negative 3.75 meters per second squared. Now I can use that acceleration to solve for time. So now I look at this equation. I'm going to get rid of the final velocity because it's zero. So I get zero equals AT plus V naught. And to solve for T, I subtract V naught from both sides. Then I divide by A. So I'll rewrite this up here. T equals negative V naught over A. So this is going to be negative two meters per second because that's the initial velocity divided by negative 3.75 meters per second squared. So I get a positive answer for time because a negative over a negative is positive. And this is going to give me 0.53 repeating seconds. Wow, that was an intense problem. And you did a great job. And this video is over.